Hello, good afternoon. My name is Michał Słota, and if you watch this backup video, probably means that I haven't managed to reach the venue on time. I promise I will do my best to at least make it to the Q&A session, but meanwhile, I will take the opportunity and take you all directly for, from the conference hall and my hotel room for a trip. But do not worry, it wouldn't be far, but it would be deep into the ground. I would like to start in an unusual perspective of seeing our agriculture, that is not an easy business, as many of you could tell, as a typical mode of business. The mode of business that has the range of inputs and labor we need to give to produce the crops effectively. We have the outputs, so the crop production that has a certain yield quantity and yield quality that affect our daily diet. We have the cultivation area, so the extent of business we could maintain, and we have a lot of un uncertainties related to the weather conditions, all the fluctuation of the factors that affect the growth of the plants, some certain area, but the major part of the factors are associated uh, with soil. So the amazing microcosm just below the plants that grow uh, on the land. So what if we reverse the whole perspective and we try to analyze and see the amazing beauty amazing synergy of the world beneath our feet. Of course, it is filled with uh, all kinds of biota, macrobiota, microbiota, with their unusual diversity that was formed by the millions of years of, of evolution and affected the soil building potential. So all that synergies of the microorganisms that form the whole network of symbiosis end up with a fragile ecosystem that consists of the continuum of plants, microbial and soil properties that affect a lot of the parameters that are crucial for the agriculture. It affects the nutrient mobilization potential, it affects the climate we are so much focused on, and of course the quality of our well-being as the food production is a major factor that affects our health. So what if we try to somehow split the complexity of the biology of the soil in the types of parameters that we could measure and we could somehow try to focus on? So let's uh, imagine the soil complexity and as kind of the Rubik's Cube that we have the soil parameters on the one axis, we have the microbiome, uh, bacteria and fungi on the next axis and on the third axis we have the plant genotype so it's genetic potential to form the the field the parameters of the of the quality and then we add another level of the complexity so we have the range of environmental conditions that affect the quality of the produce and we have the exposure to the organism that does not favor the growth of plants, but affects it in uh, a bad manner. So in this Rubik cube, we have a, a amazing amount of multiple different uh, setups that affects the end results and the productivity that is far more complicated than in case of the engineering, because biology is far more complex compared to the engineering. So let's try to dive deep into the soil as it is a main factor that forms the potential uh, of the yield produce. So of course we could try to zoom in uh, to different levels of complexity of the soil. So first of all, we have the macro aggregates. If we see the soil as physical structure, the macro aggregates are crucial for the factors related to water, filtration, physical stability, and also it is a habitat for fauna and for plant roots. 
Then if we go deeper, we have the water stable aggregates that are still crucial for some physical factors because they form a structure that absorbs the water contaminants that are uh, of course also present there and it forms the kind of the sponge that that is the medium for for, for these processes then we have the micro aggregates that are crucial for the water storage potential and also it is a basically the habitat for the for the microbiota that are contained in the soil and then if we go deeper into the structure we have the elementary soil particles that are major factors associated with the chemical buffering nutrient storage and carbon allocation in the soil so to have the whole picture uh, of the relation of the crops let's start with the basics the basics so the plant mineral requirements for an effective growth of plants so of course we have the biogenic elements so the building bricks that form our organic matter then we have the macro elements of the high plant demand so these are primary macro elements namely nitrogen phosphorus and potassium that are needed in the uh, high extent for for a su successful plant uh, growth then we have a secondary macro elements and micro elements that are necessary for a proper growth and development of the plant in some certain growth stages besides that we have the range of beneficial elements that can be required under certain environmental conditions and if we look at the different elements that possess different functions we could try to scientifically structurize it in this kind of the pretty complex chart that provides the overview of the functions that are governed but by certain basic elements macro and micro elements that somehow form a fragile structure of regulating plant metabolism so we have the compounds that are crucial for the protein synthesis of so the growth on the cellular stage they are needed for the successful cell divisions governing photosynthesis and energy metabolism for regulation of the transpiration enzymatic cycles phytohormones metabolism and so on and so forth so we then add additional complexity to this functional chart but plants demand for the micronutrients in various stages of growth is not equal because the young plants has different uh, requirements than the, the plants that go through the senescence so during the germination phase there are certain elements namely iron manganese and zinc that are needed in a higher extent just to guarantee the efficiency of the processes that are crucial for this particular stage of growth then we have the intensive vegetative growth the demands are are fluctuating and changing during the pace of the growth then we come through to the flowering and reproduction period that also involves certain range of micronutrients needed to govern the processes and then we get the maturity and senescence that also needs to be regulated using certain range of elements then to add additional layer for that we have like in the human body we have the the, the range of hormones that regulate our our growth processes the developmental processes in plants we have the range of uh, phytohormones that are in some certain stages uh, of growth of plants are crucial on controlling the, the the regular outcome of the growth pace so we have the gibberellins that are present starting from the early germination 
up to the fruiting stage and also that are uh, associated with the seed dormancy processes. Then we've got the cytokinins and auxins that are crucial for the vegetative growth until the flowering and uh, fruit formation phases. Then we have the hormones, the so-called stress-related hormones like ethylene that are present from the flowering stage until the leaf abscission, so when the plants lose its leaf. And we have the abscisic acid, so uh, what the, the soul name means, it's, it's associated with the abscission. So the process when the plants uh, takes off the leaves and also in the regulating of the, of the seed dormancy. But the whole picture is far more complex. The recent modeling of the interaction and cross-link between different hormones lead to the conclusion that it is really a fragile network of all the information and the control hubs that govern the, the processes. So the picture is not uh, dark and white. We have a wide range of, of, of gray, so there are times of life of plants what needs the regulation governed by a range of different chemical factors. So to put uh, the information that we already get together, we have the successive stages of growth of plants that need some certain range of uh, mineral cofactors that govern the processes of growth. And we have the growth processes that is like this, the scarves, when we have the involvement on specific phytohormones that govern cell divisions to have more cells to sustain the growth of the tissues. Then we have the, the new hormones uh, increases the level to get the growth phase of, 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 the, of the plant tissues. We get to the maturity stage when the new hormones are released of course, we also have the effects of the hormones that are produced from the bacteria. And then we go to the senescent stage and the seeds for the not, uh, next generation uh, appears. But it is not all. Uh, of course, in the rhizosphere, so the sphere when the root affects the biology of the plant growth above ground, we have uh, far more chemicals that are that affects the, the whole picture. So just to name the type of the compounds we have there, we have a range of organic acids that are species, species specific, that are related to the environmental conditions that plant face. We have amino acids and amides that are produced. We have a range of different enzymes that play the, their usual roles in governing plant metabolism. We have the growth factors among of these phytohormones were already discussed. We have also phenolic acids and sugars. All of this affects the conditions where the plant emerge the root into the soil structure and have a range of the function. First of all, it, it regulates the positive interaction with the biota that could be beneficial for the growth of the plants. So allows the formation of the symbiosis. Then there is the effect on the nutrient uptake, uh, the processes related to the soil amendment in terms of pH, but also other conditions, and also the regulation of negative feedback from the soil. So the biota that could be harmful, bacteria, viruses, pests, that could be uh, harmful for the plant growth. So the plant exposure to environmental stresses, plants exposed to different uh, not optimal conditions, starting from the deficit or excess of water, temperature that could be uh, beyond the limits of the tolerance of plants. We could uh, have a salt stress and substrate pH stress, too high UV radiation, nutrient imbalance, mecha mechanical damage or other chemical exposure. So then we could imagine that the physiological balance of plants is uh, 
like trying to balance the amount of the oxidative stress, so it is the primary stress caused in the plant tissues by the accumulation of reactive oxygen species and the antioxidant activity of the plant that try to somehow balance and neutralize the stress on the physiological level. But the stress is not a new factor for a plant. Plants have evolved in the exposure to, to a wide range of environmental stresses. They emerge from the safe oceans to the hostile environment on the volcanic ashes, where there was intensive land erosion, there was low amount of available bio, biogenic elements, high insulation of exposed slopes due to the, to the fact that the ozone layer was, was for already format, formating there, and the exposure to a range of toxic elements, namely cadmium and, and, and lead. And uh, plant growth in these conditions is uh, like a balancing between the optimal, optimal conditions that affect positively the growth and negative con conditions that could cause a growth inhibition, biomass decrease, leaf wilting, chlorophyll decrease, and metabolic disorders. Part of the, uh, of the effects we could observe in our own eyes or under the microscope, part of these are not visible and needs to be analyzed using some specific biomarkers. But then we have like a speedometer or, or a scale. It's, it's not that we have the, 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 the full exposure to stress. It's always a state uh, of the exposure in some certain uh, growth conditions. And if we try to look on the situation with the high magnitude, so focus on the metabolism, the stress is perceived by some uh, signal transduction me mechanism in, in the cellular uh, stage because Plants need to be alerted to react properly to the stress. Here we have the range of the stress factor that we already discussed, and we have the network of signal transductions that leads to the gene activation. I do not want to focus too much on the, on the mechanism, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that plants is triggered by the stress that uh, causes the uh, reactive oxygen species to emerge and try, try to control this state and adjust its mechanism to somehow react to the, to the stress exposure. So the target uh, mechanisms that are involved end up with the protein synthesis, but the specific proteins, proteins that are affected in the osmoprotection, so trying to somehow balance the water content of the cells, the production of the heat shock proteins it is a category of the proteins that is universal for the reaction to the stresses and somehow try to protect the cell from the, uh, from the exposure to stress. We have the molecular chaperones that are the safeguards of the other proteins and of course the antioxidants that try to relieve the oxygenative stress here. And all this molecular mechanism leads us to the stress tolerance and acclimation on different extent. It, of course, it differs for certain crop, certain variety, and certain uh, stress exposure. And if we try to answer this question, if the situation seems clear now. There is a lot of the factors that affect the plant growth, but the whole picture is still not complete. Because in every habitat of the soil, in every location of, of the, on the world, we have uh, different soil conditions that affects the amazing biodiversity of the bacteria and fungi and nematodes that are contained into this specific soil habitat. So we have the different physical chemical characteristic of the soil, and we have a biotic network of different microbiota that affects all the processes that we have already discussed. 
So the microbiome, so the next level of com soil complexity has a range of the effects of, on our typical growth of, of plant root. There is the factors related to the climate regulation because some specific bacteria can release or absorb methane and affect the climate. There is the range of processes that are rela related to nutrient cycling. So the uptake of the nutrients or solubilization of specific nutrients and allowing them to enter plant cells. There is a crop growth stimulation that is available that, that enables uh, the effects of bacteria metabolism on plant uh, developmental processes. Then we have the factors related to pest and disease, disease control. And last but not least, certain bacteria species and fungi species can affect the pollutant degradation that were released by the human to the ecosphere and affects negatively crop growth. So trying to somehow characterize the good soil conditions and bad soil condition uh, in this uh, kind of simplification, there are some parameters related to the crop and related to the soil balance that somehow characterize if the state is stabilized, is healthy or not. So we have the parameters related to the photosynthesis efficiency, yielding potential and exposure to biotic and abiotic stresses. And in the above, uh, above ground uh, part and below ground part, we have all the parameters related to the availability of the nutrients, uh, uptake of the resources, also the water uptake that characterize the state in case of the health parameters and maintaining a proper crop growth. So what can we do to try to somehow uh, provide a st better stress management for crops? It was done since uh, centuries. It, the, the, the effects could be plant centric. So it is a breeding for the stress tolerance that was done by the centuries by our civilization. So we are selecting the varieties or the, the seeds of the crop that perform better under specific stress exposure, namely drought or, or freezing. There are now some genome editing methods. There are some seed treatment proto, uh, protocols that could somehow facilitate the growth of crop in the next uh, generation. And it is also an optimization of the uh, timing of, of planting and harvesting the, 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 the seeds. There, the, there are the effects related to, to the soil. So a specific soil conditioning, so adding the organic matter or adding biochar and compost or other practices that are related to the water management, to the tillage management, uh, adding the crop rotation and optimization of the, of the growth of plants. So nutrient management, and adding some specific organic and non-organic amendments. So in case of the microbial diversity that was already discussed, there, is, there were different stages of the development of the practices that we somehow try to optimize the balance of the microbiome in the soil to affect positively plants. So the first stage involved the traditional approach that scientists tried to characterize specific bacteria strains, propagate them and release again to the soil to gain some, some additional positive effect on plant growth. There on the second stage, there were some kind of the customization that specific probiotics, so inoculants and, and prebiotics, so root exudates of plants were collected and uh, prepared as a treatment or as a biofertilizer to release again to the soil. And the last stage that is mainly the key focus of, of, of most of the strategies for stimulating the crops right now is adding the additional complexity 
so we try to characterize the bacteria uh, and fungi that are under the influence of specific environmental factors and the crop breeding for uh, beneficial microbiome. So we try to adjust the breeding programs of crops and characterize um, and identify the, the, the microbiome that could be uh, beneficial for some certain crops and certain growth conditions. And that could lead us to very promising um, outcomes. So not to mention all the known effects on the stimulation of yielding quality and yielding quantity. It can lead to the better stress tolerance and involve some specific uh, microbials for the improvement of root characteristic in a given site. So we could treat that microbiome as a first aid kit for, for the growth. So try to somehow exchange our typical nutrient, uh, nutrient uptake programs to adding specific bacteria that will favor the nitrogen accumulation like azotobacter or is a bacterium, then we could use some bacteria from the uh, bacillus genera to favor the processes of the phosphorus uh, solubilization and uptake by plant roots. We could do the same with the uh, potassium uptake or sulfur uptake, trying to somehow compose the microbiome that would favor this kind of the nutrient uptake programs. But trying to somehow to see the holistic picture is not easy to focus on the single study that, would, uh, that wouldn't reflect all that complexity. So I, uh, for the end of this presentation, I would try to discuss a little bit uh, better analysis. So a complex study that involved over 1,000 of pairs of open field data sets that were tested in a different uh, world location, uh, testing different crops, namely some vegetables, fruit trees, cereals, legumes, tuber crops, and others under a specific biostimulant application. So trying to summarize the effects, different categories of the biostimulants uh, were tested by the researchers that involved the ketosan, humic, and fulvic acid-based formulas, silicon-oriented uh, silicon formulation, protein hydrolysate, phosphate uh, ions, seaweed extract, and plant extract. So among of these, the most effective were uh, confirmed to be the plant extract, and the less effective were the phosphates, but the phosphates are mostly um, related to the, bio, uh, to the biotic stress response, namely the, the, the fungi exposure. So to summarize this study, the average yield benefits uh, compared uh, the biostimulant application towards the control was, was about 18% of the gain. And the highest biostimulation potential was demonstrated via the soil treatment. So the yield benefit compared to the foliar treatments was more than 10 percentage higher. What is worth mention, the biostimulants were more efficient under the suboptimal growth conditions. So for example, for the arid climates or for the compacted soil, the biostimulant were more effective. And vegetables and legumes uh, were shown to have is the greatest gain in yield upon the biostimulant application. So then different study, the same author group, the test was related to uh, the effects of the microbiome application on the uh, benefits for crop uh, growth. So we had here the same the setup that cover, that cover different geographics, different crops, 
and we could summarize the effects that the average yield increase was over 30 percentage and among the tested crops and tested microbial inoculants there were some certain hotspots of the best efficiency so in terms of the vegetables it was the pseudomonas genera in terms of the uh, cereals and uh, the, there were some specific bacteria that were also effective in terms of legumes we had the burkholderia that was find that, that the effect size was was the highest so to summarize this part average gain, gain was already mentioned the two key mechanisms uh, that uh, were um, shown to have the major effects on the stimulation of crop growth was the alleviation of the stresses and improvement of the plant's nutrient availability that uh, encountered uh, over 20 percentage of the yield enhancement the pseudomonas was uh, the most uh, effective microbial inoculant that was associated with the enhancing of crop yield under different stress exposure and enterobacter was most effective in, in, in the improvement of plant nutrient availability but to summarize this part and try to reply to the question if we need to uh, uh, some external inputs of the bacteria uh, for the farm to maintain its productivity certainly not we could adjust the farming practices and adopt some sustainable farming uh, farming practices to allow the soil biology to thrive so we could reduce the tillage if of course it is not an easy process and need the adaptation of the farming practices we could employ the cover crops we could change the um, nutrition program of the of the crops add to some storm stormwater management biocontrol mechanism or add some more trees on the cropland and all of this would allow to maintain a better soil stability and on the same time would positively affect the microbiota contained in the in the soil and if uh, we could ask the question if it's worked of course it is the, this chart summarized the research from this year that tested different kind of the of the uh, soil and farming practices from conventional organic and regenerative uh, practices that compare the quality of the food of the yield produce tested on the on the cabbage plant so uh, having the same location the same crop but different practices the employment of the regenerative practices that maintain the the healthy soil end up with the higher vitamin content the higher content of specific phytocompounds that are also kind of crucial for for our healthy diet and also maintaining the highest concentration of some some uh, elements that are needed also for our diet so definitely it is worth to maintain the health of soil uh, just to keep our diet healthy and our pro uh, food production system uh, efficient so in this positive uh, summary i would like to end up my today's presentation hoping that i will make it to uh, until this time to reach for the q a session and i would be honored to take your question and discuss the topic in detail so thank you for, very much for your attention and see you there in Riga.